Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 7 of Introductory Linear Algebra. Today is all about the angle between vectors, okay? So hopefully you understand what it means to talk about the angle between vectors in two and three dimensions, but just like with everything else that we do in this course, we're going to talk about the angle between vectors in arbitrary dimensional spaces. So we'll be able to do things, for example, like compute the angle between two vectors that live in seven dimensional space, even though we can't quite picture that, okay? That's something that we'll be able to do after today's lecture. Okay, before we get there, though, let's talk about sort of the two-dimensional picture. What are we talking about when we say the angle between two vectors? Well, what we mean is those two vectors, they're situated so that their tails are located at the same spot, okay? And then the angle between them is just sort of what you think. It's sort of this measure of how far away are they pointing from each other, okay? So if you got a vector v and a vector w, then this is the angle between them in the two-dimensional case. Okay, and in this picture, it's very natural to sort of draw on the vector v minus w, because remember what that is, is that's the third side of this triangle here. v minus w, if you have v and w both in standard position like we have here, then v minus w, it's that third side, the one that goes from the head of w to the head of v. Okay, now that we've got a whole triangle there over on the right-hand side, we can compute the angle via the law of cosine. So let's go through that calculation and see what pops out in the two-dimensional case. Okay, well, the law of cosines tells me that the length of the opposite side squared equals the length of this side squared plus the length of that side squared minus this funky sort of correction term involving the cosine of the angle between them. Okay, so if that, co if that angle between them was 90 degrees, right, if the those two sides were perpendicular, in other words, if this was a right angle triangle, then what would happen is you would get, oh, this side squared equals this side squared plus this side squared minus the zero. This term would go away if it was a right angle triangle and you would just get the Pythagorean theorem. But remember the law of cosines is more general than that. It applies to any triangle. Okay, great. So we've got this funky little expression here. I want to rearrange that and solve for cosine theta. But before I do that, I'm going to note that, hey, this expression over on the left-hand side here, this length of v minus w squared, we can also expand that out in terms of the dot product. We can simplify that left-hand side a little bit. In particular, remember, well, length of anything squared equals that thing dot producted with itself. And then we can expand that out and simplify, right? Uh, the dot product here, we can expand out these brackets as v dotted with v minus w dotted with v minus v dotted with w minus w dotted with minus w. And that all simplifies down like this. We've done this sort of trick a couple times now over the past few uh, lecture videos. Okay, so if we trace things together, we've got length of v minus w squared equals two different expressions. It equals this, but it also equals this. So in particular, these right-hand sides have to be equal to each other. This ugly expression here equals this ugly expression here. So I'm going to set those equal to each other and then simplify as much as I can. Okay, and when I do that, when I set those equal to each other, all sorts of things are going to cancel, right? Because, hey, I've got a length of v squared, length of v squared. Yeah, those will cancel with each other. Length of w squared equals length of w squared. Those will cancel with each other. And then all that I'll be left with after I do my simplifications and canceling is I'm going to be left with minus 2 times blah, blah, blah equals minus 2 times the dot product. Great. Then I can cancel the minus 2s as well. Okay. And then all I'll be left with after that is dot product equals length of v times length of w times cosine theta. Okay. Great. And then I can just rearrange that and solve for cosine theta, okay? So cosine of theta equals the dot product of v with w divided by the product of the lengths. Okay, so that gives me a nice simple formula for the cosine of the angle between the two vectors, which then of course I can rearrange and just get the angle between the two vectors on one side by taking the inverse cosine function of both sides. Okay, so it's definition time. Okay, the angle between two vectors is, well, this formula that we just came up with. Okay, so suppose you've got two vectors, v and w, situated so that their tails are at the same spot, just like in the picture that we drew up above. Then the angle between them, it's the quantity arc cosine of v dot w divided by the product of their lengths. And this arc cosine, I mean, maybe you've seen arc cosine before. Um, if you haven't seen that before, maybe you've seen cosine inverse before. It just means, you know, the function that undoes what cosine does. It's our way of, you know, taking the cosine theta away from the left-hand side so that now it's an arc cosine on the right-hand side. It's the function that is the inverse of cosine. Okay, you know, at least on a restricted uh, interval of angles. All right. 
So this definition, it's just another way of writing down this formula that we saw up above, okay? But again, the way to think of this is we proved that this formula holds in the two-dimensional case, and now we're sort of defining it in higher dimensional cases because we don't have any intrinsic understanding of what angles mean in higher dimensional cases, right? Like if I asked you before today, what is the angle between these two vectors in six dimensional space? Well, you can't picture those two vectors. So, I mean, even if you could draw them somehow, like what, what, what does it mean to talk about an angle between them? Okay, we didn't have even a notion of what angles meant in higher dimensional spaces before this lecture. Now we do. This this is what we mean by angles now, okay, in all dimensions. It's a theorem in two and three dimensions. It's a definition in higher dimensions. Okay, that's enough about that. Let's go through an example, okay? How do we compute the angle between two vectors? Let's start off with two vectors in four dimensions, because why not? We can do that now. Okay, let's find the angle between these two vectors, 1, 1, 1, 1, and 2, 0, 2, 0. Okay, so what do we need to compute to compute the angle between two vectors? Well, we need all of the bits and pieces that go into this formula. So we need to compute the dot product of those two vectors, and then we need to compute their lengths. Okay, so let's start off with those bits and pieces. Let's start off with the dot product between those two vectors. So you just dot these two things, and so that means multiply entry-wise and add up, and we're just going to get 2 plus 0 plus 2 plus 0, which of course is 4. All right, next thing we need to compute is, well, we're going to need length of v, so let's compute that. Length of v is, well, square each of the entries, add them up, and square root at the end of the day. You're going to get root 4, which, of course, is 2. We're also going to need a length of w, so let's compute that. Length of w is, again, square them all, add them up, square root at the end of the day. You're going to get 4 plus 4, so that's 8 under the square root. Another way of writing that is 2 root 2. All right, great. So now we've got all the bits and pieces that we need plug them into this formula and see what angle you get, okay? So the angle theta is the arc cosine of v dot w divided by the product of their lengths. So arc cosine of, well, just plug in those bits and pieces. v dot w is four, so that goes in on the top, and then two times two root two goes in on the bottom. Simplify a little bit on the inside there. This four is gonna cancel with the two twos on the bottom. You're just left with one over root two inside the arc cosine. And I claim that just equals pi over 4. In other words, 45 degrees. Okay, And where that comes from, I mean, if you're not comfortable computing these arc cosines, where this comes from is drawing a triangle, right? I want to draw a triangle that has an angle whose cosine equals 1 over root 2. Okay, so let's draw that triangle. Okay, And so what we're doing is we, we're drawing a triangle, and then we're saying the cosine of this angle has to be 1 over root 2. In other words, the ratio adjacent over hypotenuse has to be 1 over root 2. Okay, so I draw on the 1, I draw on the root 2. And then Pythagoras tells me this side has to be 1. And then I look at it and say, oh, it's isosceles, right? It's got 1 and 1, so these two angles have to be the same, okay? And if they're the same, well, they got to be pi over 4. That's the only way the angles can actually add up to 180 degrees or pi over 2. Or pi, sorry. Okay, so that angle there, it's got to be pi over 4. This is a special triangle, right? This is one of those two special triangles that you should have memorized. This is the 1, 1, root 2 special triangle. Okay, the other one is the, you know, the 1, 2, root 3 special triangle. All right, let's do another example. This time, let's do a three-dimensional example, because again, this formula, it applies in any dimensions, so it applies in three dimensions as well. Let's find the angle between the two diagonals of two adjacent faces of a cube, okay? And so we're gonna start off by drawing a picture or rather having a computer draw a picture for us here just so that we understand exactly what this question is asking of us, okay? Um, so let's, let's just do that. And here I've sort of situated the cube in a particular way. It doesn't matter where we orient the cube in space. So I've oriented it so that, you know, the back corner is at the origin at zero, 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 and it's got a front corner up here at one, one, one. Okay, I mean, it could be a bigger cube, it could be rotated around, it's not going to matter because it's not going to affect this angle between the two, uh, between the diagonals of two adjacent faces of that cube. We can orient it however we like. All right, and now what I've done is I've claimed that, you know, this diagonal going from down here, down here, up over here is 0, minus 1, 1, and I claim that this vector is minus 1, 0, 1. So how do we see that? Where does that come from? Well, I mean, just note, uh, take note of where they point from and where they point to, okay? So let's start off with this vector over here on the left. Where's it pointing from? Well, it's pointing from this corner down here, 
which I mean, it's a distance of one in the X direction, a distance of one in the Y direction, and it's down on the floor. So it's a distance of zero in the Z direction. So that's the point, one, one, zero. And it's pointing from there up to this corner up here, which, well, it's a distance of one in the X direction, one in the Z direction, but then zero in the Y direction. So it's one, zero, one. Okay. And similarly, this other vector, it's pointing from that same point, 1, 1, 0, but this time it's pointing up to the corner 0, 1, 1 instead of 1, 0, 1. Okay. So then to compute the vectors, you just subtract. You do head minus tail. Okay. You do where they're pointing to minus where they came from. All right. So V, this one here, it's, well, it went to 1, 0, 1, and it came from 1, 1, 0, and you subtract them and you get this vector here. The coordinates of the vector are 0, minus 1, 1. Remember, vectors represent displacement or motion, and the sort of motion to get from this bottom right corner to that top left corner, well, you have to walk 0 in the x direction, minus 1 in the y direction, and up 1 in the z direction. Okay, and similarly for w, okay, it's just head minus tail gives you coordinates of vector. All right, so all of that was just to get the coordinates of the vectors that we're gonna compute the angle between now. Okay, so now that we know the vectors, now we do our angle formula. So again, we've gotta compute dot product and then two vector lengths and plug into the formula. Okay, so the dot product, you just compute the dot product of these two vectors here, V and W, and you're just gonna get zero plus zero plus one. So just the dot product is one, nothing too fancy there. Next up, the length of that vector V there, just compute the length of this, and it's just going to be 0 plus 1 plus 1, all square rooted. It's root 2. Okay, And similarly for w, you compute the length of this vector w, you're going to find that you, know, you get root 2 again. And again, be careful. When you square these negative entries, they turn into positive. Negative 1 squared, that's plus 1. So you get 1 plus 0 plus 1 square rooted is root 2. And then you plug all of that into our formula for the angle between two vectors. So up here on the top, I've got the dot product, which was 1. And down on the bottom, I've got the product of the lengths, which is root two times root two. So in other words, I'm gonna get arc cosine of a half, okay? And again, this actually comes from one of our special triangles. Arc cosine of a half just equals pi over three. In other words, 60 degrees, okay? And that comes from our one, two, root three special triangle. So again, draw a triangle that has adjacent over hypotenuse ratio equal to one half. And when you do that, you're gonna find that the angle between them has to be pi over three. Okay, another way to see the answer here is actually to think geometrically, like, right? Like what we did here, this calculation down here, is sort of a very algebraic way of solving this problem, but you can solve it geometrically as well. And sort of the clever trick that you can do to get the answer very quickly geometrically is, well, you can notice that if I draw one more side, one more diagonal face connecting these two diagonal faces, then what I've got is an equilateral triangle, right? This diagonal face and this one and this one, certainly they all have the same side length, or sorry, the same, I don't know, diagonal length. Okay, so that's an equilateral triangle, and we know in any equilateral triangle, the angles are 60 degrees, or pi over three. Okay, so that's another way to get the answer, sort of a quicker and easier way to get the answer, but you sort of have to sort of have a clever insight to see that, so it's maybe a little bit trickier to do that. All right, so there's one thing about this definition of an angle that maybe should cause you a little bit of worry, okay? If I go back up to this, this definition of angle in arbitrary uh, dimensional spaces, we compute the arc cosine of this quantity here. But the arc cosine of a quantity only makes sense if that quantity is between minus one and one. Okay, so then the question is, how do we know that this quantity here is between minus one and one? Like, why is that true? Is it true? Okay, how do we know that it's between minus one and one so that we can take the arc cosine of it? Okay, and the answer actually is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Remember the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality told us that the absolute value of the dot product is always less than or equal to the product of the lengths of those vectors. So the thing on top here is always less than or equal to the thing on the bottom. Okay, so that's how, the we, how we know that it's less than or equal to one. So that's how we know we can take the arc cosine of it. So that's how we know that this definition actually makes sense. We already knew that it made sense in two dimensions because we were able to draw a picture and derive that formula. But if we're claiming that formula also makes sense and should be the definition in higher dimensional spaces, then we'd better make sure that, you know, we can actually do that formula, like we can plug things into it and get a sensible answer out. 
in arbitrary dimensional spaces. And the cauchy schwartz inequality is the thing that makes that happen. It's the thing that makes this definition actually work. Okay, so that's another reason that we need the cauchy schwartz inequality. All right, and then one final thing for this week is there's a very, very important special case of this angle formula, okay? And that special case is when the dot product of two vectors equals zero, okay? So now we're gonna look at what happens in this formula if this dot product on the top here happens to equal zero? Okay, well, what happens? Well, then the angle between the two vectors is just copying down the formula for angle between vectors. It's still that same formula. But the point is, if the dot product between the two vectors is zero, then it doesn't matter what their length is because it's just zero divided by something, which is zero, okay? So the angle is just arc cosine of zero, okay? And arc cosine of zero is pi over two, in other words, 90 degrees, okay? In other words, cosine of pi over two is zero, right? I mean, if you think about the cosine graph, if you go over to pi over two, that's its first root. That's where it first crosses the x-axis, okay? So arc cosine of zero is then pi over two. Okay, so what that means is that if the dot product of two vectors equals zero, then that means that those two vectors are perpendicular to each other, because that's what an angle of pi over two or 90 degrees means. It means they're pointing at right angles. All right, so this is a very important special case. We're gonna give it to its own name, okay? We say that two vectors, again, in arbitrary dimensions, they're called orthogonal if v dot w equals zero, if their dot product is zero, okay? And orthogonality, orthogonal, you know, it sort of just means perpendicular, except a version of perpendicular that also applies in 87 dimensional uh, spaces, right? All right, so let's just do a quick couple quick examples to make sure that we understand what's going on here. Let's show that these two vectors are orthogonal. Let's show that they're pointing at right angles to each other, all right? And the way you do this is just take their dot product. There's nothing fancy here, okay? So you do one times three, well, that's three, plus one times one, that's one, plus minus two times two, well, that's minus four. You add all those up, of course, you get zero, okay? So the really magical thing here is just how easy that calculation was, okay? We just did a bunch of multiplications and additions and we got our answer. So now we know those two vectors are orthogonal to each other. If you're anything like me though, actually picturing those two vectors in three-dimensional space, if I tried to convince myself of this geometrically by picturing them or drawing them or something like that, that would be extremely difficult for me. And I expect that it would be extremely difficult for most of you. So really like this, this orthogonality being related to the dot product in this way is really, really remarkable and how much easier it makes these calculations. All right, let's do another quick example here. Let's find a non-zero vector that's orthogonal to just any given vector in two-dimensional space. So just any vector, call it V1, V2. Okay, let's try to find some non-zero vector that's orthogonal to it. And maybe just a quick side note on why I have this word non-zero in here. If I didn't throw that word in there, then you could just very quickly answer, ah, the zero vector is my answer. That's something that's orthogonal to the vector V because the zero vector is always orthogonal to everything, right? If I do the dot product of the zero vector with anything, I'm gonna get zero. So it's orthogonal to everything. Okay, so usually we're interested in non-zero vectors that are orthogonal to whatever we're talking about. All right, so yeah, let's find a non-zero vector that's orthogonal to just any given vector. Okay, so we're gonna do this just basically by eyeballing. If I take some vector and dot it with this, I want that dot product to equal zero. So I sort of want the two terms in the dot product to cancel out with each other. Okay, so what if the other vector that I construct, what if I just put V2 in its first entry and then I put minus V1 in its second entry? Okay, what happens then if I do the dot product? Well, the dot product then, if I choose this vector W, so if I just sort of swap the entries of, of V and then put a minus sign on one of them, then what's gonna happen when I take the dot product is I'm gonna get V1 times V2 and then V2 times minus V1. And I add those up and sure enough, I get zero. Okay, yeah, so no matter what vector V I give you, in two-dimensional space at least, you can always find this other vector W that you know is orthogonal to it, that's perpendicular to it. Okay, and geometrically, all that we've done here is, you know, here's the vector V that we're given. I don't know actually where it's uh, pointing, right? But this is just sort of a representative diagram. You got some vector V. Well, the vector W is down here, okay, right? V, it's pointing over V1 units. Well, then W is pointing down V1 units. Okay, and if V is pointing up V2 units, then W is pointing over V2 units. 
Right? You're just sort of interchanging the X and Y and negating one of them. Okay, so this is very related to like negative reciprocals. If you've ever seen negative reciprocals for finding slopes of perpendicular lines, this is the same thing, right? You're just sort of interchanging X and Y and then throwing minus sign on one of them. Alrighty, so that'll do it for today's class. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll sort of ramp up a lot of these ideas to higher dimensional spaces, like how do we find perpendicular vectors in three and four and seven dimensions and stuff like that. Okay, so I will see you next class when we start week three's material.